Evidence of human settlement on Vancouver Island goes back 9,000 years. Sophisticated cultures developed and the people thrived in part because of a mild climate and an abundant food supply. Captain Cook arrives in 1778 in Friendly Cove. It is the first European contact with Canada's West Coast First Nations people. The people are eager to trade their furs, and because of the high quality of the pelts, Friendly Cove is one of the busiest fur trading ports on the West Coast of North America for many years. In the late 1860s, politicians in Ottawa were trying to entice British Columbia into Confederation. The west coast of BC, of course, would give them direct access to Asian markets. BC becomes part of Canada in 1871. And in 1873, Ottawa presents a plan to get a rail line to Victoria. The plan calls for building a rail line into Butte Inlet. From there, with a series of bridges, onto Sonora Island, Quadra Island, finally into Campbell River. And from Campbell River, the rail line would be built down to Victoria. I'm sure for somebody sitting at a desk in Ottawa, this looked pretty easy. There was only one problem. They forgot to do a survey. BC's coastal mountain range, north of Vancouver, is some of the most rugged terrain you'll find anywhere on the planet. Because of the high cost of building the line to Butte Inlet, the plan was scrapped.
Via Rail takes over passenger service in 1978, but it never really seems to invest in the service. The run is a perennial money loser, costing Via between 950 and 1.9 million a year. And it's no wonder when you look at the schedule. The train left Victoria at 8.30 a.m. and arrived at Courtney at 1 p.m. Then it would turn around and go back to Victoria, arriving at 6. A commuter service from Nanaimo to Victoria would have made more sense, with limited service to Courtney. Via stops operating the Dayliner in 2011, claiming that the tracks are just too unsafe. In 1996, the Island Corridor Foundation takes ownership of the line in return for millions of tax credits to the CPR. Their stated mission is to improve passenger service on Vancouver Island. After 2011, the ICF brings all of the stakeholders to the table, and it looks like they might succeed. But there's one notable holdout. Via Rail has no interest in participating, saying they just can't afford to lose money on a rail line on Vancouver Island. As time passes, the tracks get older, and the cost for repairing the old line goes up every year. Stay tuned. From the hilltops just north of Campbell River, early explorers would have been amazed at the sea of trees stretching out below them. Vancouver Island was covered in pristine old growth rainforests. With a mild climate and an abundant supply of rainfall, 
trees grew to be thousands of years old here. Douglas fir, grand fir, western red cedar, Sitka spruce, hemlock, balsam, alder, and maple, they towered hundreds of feet into the air. Many Europeans had never seen anything like it. Word soon got out, and by 1850, timber from Vancouver Island was being sold worldwide for shipbuilding. Falling by hand was hard work and dangerous, but the men came. The early loggers used a method called high grading. They would take the biggest Douglas fir and Sitka spruce and leave the rest of the forest behind. It was still a messy business, but as the forest recovered, it was a mixed species. I had a five acre property on a Gulf Island that had been high graded. There were huge cedars and balsams, as well as the leftover gigantic stumps from the logging operation. Yep. Whoa! Yep.
When Europeans arrived, the ocean, rivers, lakes, and streams were full of fish, especially when the salmon were spawning. In the late 1800s, canned salmon was very popular, and by 1918, there were 80 canneries along the PC coast. Out on the water, it was a free-for-all. There was no oversight. By the 60s, after years of logging watersheds, dam building, and overfishing, stocks were collapsing. The DFO started building hatcheries on dammed rivers and supporting volunteer groups to run small hatcheries. In the 70s, stocks were rebounding and the commercial fishing fleet was thriving. In 1981, there were 1,600 commercial trawlers. Stocks were declining again, and the DFO started buying out fishermen. By 2001, the commercial fleet was down to 540 boats. Today, the fleet spends most of its time tied up at the dock. Up and down the east coast of the island, from Victoria to Campbell River, every major watershed has been logged to make way for development. Farming along the rivers and cutting down riparian zones has also had a negative impact. Some loggers will tell you it's the dams that are to blame. Environmentalists point to fish farms as the main culprit. Sports fishermen will tell you that there's just too many sea lions and seals. Commercial fishermen will tell you that there are too many fish lodges and too many sports fishermen. As a fishing guide friend of mine once told me, it's the whole bowl of wax. All of these factors are putting downward pressure on stocks. Today, in 2022, climate change brings a whole new set of challenges. Because of logging, some rivers and streams that used to have water in them all year can get very low some even dry up, and with the recent heat waves, the water gets too warm. Young salmon that are still in the river can get trapped in the small pools and suffocate. The Pacific Ocean is warming, and scientists that study salmon are concerned about deep ocean survival rates. Today, most species of wild salmon are in steep decline, some on the verge of extinction. In the short span of a hundred years, on the east side of the island from Victoria to Campbell River, we have completely altered the landscape and salmon are paying the price. At the turn of the last century, the world's wealthy elite were always on the lookout for new adventure and they discovered Vancouver Island. They came to Lake Cowichan for a true wilderness experience. Fly fishing was all the rage, and the Cowichan River was a fly fisher's dream. In 1924, the Taiyi Club was formed in Campbell River, and word spread about the giant salmon people were catching. The wealthy would stay at the posh Painter's Lodge and go out with guys to fish in the famous Taiyi Pool. There's not as many of the big Taiyi as there used to be, but it's still a popular destination. Of course, you don't have to be wealthy to go fishing. There are still salmon to be caught if you know where to go and when to go. Whale watching has been big business since the late 70s, and that continues. 
In recent years, humpback and gray whales have returned to the Salish Sea. With more restrictions on sport fishing, guides have turned to wildlife tours and whale watching. Mountains offer great hiking and breathtaking vistas. There are lakes with trout everywhere, especially the north end of the island. And of course, Long Beach is the surf capital of Canada. Today the island's going through another boom, a real estate boom. People are coming here in big numbers, pushing our capacity to the limit. So even though things are changing on the island, it, it's still a great place to live. I, I love it. And, and I guess we have some room. The island is about the same size as Taiwan, uh, with a population of, I think, 33 million. So I guess we have a room for a few more folks. Cheers. Thanks for watching.